What's up? Bamo. I hear you. Can you hear me? That's the most important part. Can you see me? <laughs> see you, Mary Chris. That is high definition DSLR you're working with right there. I'm gonna stop the video. You don't deserve to look at this face. <laughs> probably right, probably right. Can I just tell your story? Yeah. 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 That's a pretty good, that's a perfect place to start. So you're holding on to some line that's attached to a boat and one end gets caught on a prop like a fucking horror movie nightmare, tightens the rope around your arm. Bammo. You're a one arm guy. Couldn't even couldn't even reenact it if you try. Yeah. You know? And your mom says to you that's you jump in here. We're like going back and forth. <laughs> and your mom says to you, you're like, mom, what the fuck? And your mom says, it's just an arm. Powerful, powerful words. When I, when I was 23 or 24 years old, I came home from college and I was sitting with my mom down by the water in Benicia, California with my great Dane that she told me not to get, but I got it anyway. Of course. And she's paying for my college and I've been going forever. And I look at her and I say, mom, I've been smoking weed every single day, like 10 times a day. I think it's a problem. And do you know what my mom said? You should problem fix that. Problem. Yeah, you should fix that. And she you gave it no that. energy. And we went on to the next conversation and boom, I don't think I ever smoke weed again. I'm 48 years old. It was weird. It was wow. like, that's cool. You, when I heard you tell your story, I was like, wow, moms have this like magic power. And I tell my mom the story. She's like, I don't remember that shit. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. But I mean, you talk about, talk about superheroes, right? Yeah. And typically it's portrayed most when you reflect and you find those moments or you realize that memory that was like a pivotal moment, everything changed, it's profound. You remember it forever. In the moment, it was like no big deal. It was not, at least in my uh, experience. Does your mom was, remember saying that to you? Does your mom remember that? Oh, absolutely. And okay. it, her intention was nowhere near what it's, what it's application has turned into for me. Right. Her, her use of those words was try to calm herself down, you know, try to get her to grasp. Holy shit. My son, is he about to die? I don't know. He just lost the blood. There's more blood out of his body than in his body. What's going to happen. But when I have to provoke that question and that thought in my mind at 13 years old, scrawny little kid, that's what she needed to say for her mental health and to be a, uh, or try to portray herself as a solid sound figure for me, you know, in this uncertain experience and what the hell's going on. Mom, what if I lose my arm? Logan, it's just an arm. Is it, is it the fact that she gave it? No, like I always, I always, I can only speak for myself and that's why I'm projecting on you, but it was the fact to me, I always thought, Oh shit. It's the fact my mom gave it no energy that it went away. Like, why do you think that that was such a profound, like, do you think, Oh, my mom doesn't think it's, do you think subconsciously you're like, Oh, my mom doesn't think it's I, I, a big deal that I only have one arm. I guess I won't think it's a big deal either. Or like, how does that work? What, what, what was the mechanism that kind of ha helped you transcend this loss? You know what I, why, how I explained that message and how I interpreted it um, was just a perspective shift. It's just an immediate perspective shift. And you can do this with anything, anytime, any, any instance in life, no matter what. For this example, our human anatomy, we have two of a lot of things. And the, the, it's just an arm. In my mind, uh, what I heard from that was, oh, shit, you're right. I do have another one. Like, there is another one. And I know that's not the typical, like, oh, yeah, you're fine in this life if you have one. But you're much better off if you have one arm than if you don't have a life. So my, my perspective shifted immediately from those words to recognizing abundance, recognizing the good. And the good in that moment was that I was alive. And I was conscious. You know, I lost more blood in my body than I should have to be conscious. I stayed conscious for uh, way longer than I should have. I never went unconscious, which is wild. But how many hours had it been since the accident when she said that to you? Uh, at that point, it was two, two hours, hour and a half in. Fuck, that's a lot ambulance. to process. That's a lot to process for a 13 year old boy. Yeah, and I was left handed, you know, so it was my dominant arm. Uh, had a bright future ahead of me for lacrosse. That was really my team sport of choice. And I was attempting to go professional wakeboarding. That's, you know, how that had to happen, wakeboard, finishing wakeboarding. But 
it wasn't just like a recreational fun day on the lake. Like that was my, that was my sport. That was my jam. Played lacrosse because I went to a, a awesome school that had a great program. But my goal was becoming a professional whiteboard. How old are you, Logan? Twenty nine. Do you have kids yet? No. Oh, yeah, you're too. Take care of myself. Kidding me. Um, uh, um. I watch your kids though all the time, man. We have to say something about that. It's amazing. Amazing. <laughs> I feel like I'm a part of your family. That's awesome. You do a great job. Of it. You do a great job of that. It's so cool to see how you can use a freaking platform like Instagram and flip the script, man. Forget these influencers and the filters and the freaking all this shit going on. On no, you're like, hey, what's up? Here we are. These are my kids. Let me tell you about what happened today. And Don't get me started. I watch it and I'm like, you. This is Don't get awesome, me started. Man. Um, your dad has your dad ever, um. It's funny. I have 200 questions here in front of you. And I told myself, I'm not going to have a conversation with them. I'm just going to plow through questions, but I just can't help it. um, Your dad, I wonder how much blame he put on himself. He was driving the boat, right? Exactly. Like I would probably, if that happened with my sons and I was there and I had nothing and I, and I was there, I would, I, I don't know. I would lose my, I would just, I mean, I don't mean to say to, 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 uh, to step on your pity party for losing your arm, but no, fucking no, no. this guy made you. It was no big deal. You're his pride what and happened? joy. You're assisting chapel. You're his everything. Right. I had no idea. You know, 13 years old. Not, it was probably not until seven or eight years later did the light bulb moment go off in my head. And I was like, holy shit. How is this experience for my parents? Like what happened with them? That's, those are good parents, by the way. They should protect you from having those thoughts. You want your kids to kind of yeah. take you for granted until, yeah. until they're ready not to. That's awesome. Okay, tell me more. So my dad, well, first of all, I know I've told my story like a hundred times on different podcasts, but I got to say, very impressed with you already. You know all the details, man. This is awesome. So thank you for doing due diligence. I, dude, I did like five or 10 minutes of research on you. <laughs> okay. Google Logan Aldridge, tell you 20 times how he lost his arm. That's pretty accurate. Yeah. <laughs> um, so no, so with my dad, man, my dad, you know, growing up was like the superhero to my brother and I, I have an older brother, a few years older, uh, blue collar, hard worker, owns our family business, commercial refrigeration. He's always gone construction sites, managing his crew, the company traveling. Didn't see him a lot. My mom, your, your mom's a loan shark. Yeah. Yeah. And she was crushing it before 08 and uh, we were traveling the world doing all sorts of awesome things. My dad was the freaking, you know, up early, home late, wearing the, the jeans and just going to work, getting his hands dirty. And, and supporting your that. dreams and supporting your dreams to be a professional wakeboarder, spending Absolutely. every moment, free Absolutely. moment he has taking care of his. Driving the boat, yeah. Taking me yeah. out early morning rides, late night rides. Never did I appreciate that. Obviously like most privileged kids and you shouldn't you shouldn't that's our job as parents they can word they can thank us later yeah well it was you know years later and i thought so i, I want to tell you a bit personal something yes. personal uh, i've never talked about this on a podcast before but i think it helps when you talk about my dad and you want to know about my dad and how i feel uh this is important for me to say you know after my accident lost when i was 13 um puberty Go to going to high school, 14, 15. I get my learner's permit. I get my driver's license at 16. Yeah, which that was the, that's a story in and of itself. Me taking driver's ed with one arm, just freaking lean back in the car, just cruising like a gangster. And the driver's ed teacher, can't, you can't say 10 and 2 over here, bro. No, this is freaking 12 <laughs> only. But uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, I digress. Um, when I was, after my accident, um, my parents ended up separating, getting a divorce when they were, when I was around 16. So a few years after my accident, my accident was a moment that brought them together. They needed to come together to figure out how they're going to deal with their son's traumatic injury and his life moving forward. So 14, 15, in the beginning of 16, we, as a family, we were a unit because we needed to be like, it was critical for, for my, my life, my health. 
they never, never in my whole life did I ever know my parents had any problems. Like, you know, it was never portrayed to us. We never knew about any issues. And it was, it was ultimately without going into too many details, they just had grown out of love with each other and were just going in separate directions. Right. The kids had gotten older. My brother was off to college. I was well on my way, obviously at 16 in, in the near future. So it was a harsh reality, but it was why what happened was my mom moved out of our house and our house was like, it was like a compound, like, Grandparents live next to us. Aunt and uncle live up at the top. They moved out. I'm turning 16. I got my driver's license. I am still just like every other average kid at that age. A little bit of a jockey, a little bit of a punk, a little bit of an extreme sports enthusiast. So the only things that matter is girls. Yes. yes. Never home. Definitely not home. Yeah. I was never home. Weeknights. Yep. Yep. So, and this is the part I deal with. Uh, I have the most guilty conscience about this because um, my father, this blind side of him, the separation, he had no idea. He was just blue collar working all the time. Thought love is love. Things are great. It'll be better. It's, kids will be gone. We'll have a house ourselves. That just wasn't the case. Uh, and now I can see you know, fast forward. Now they're both remarried, happily married. It's incredible. Um, great for them. But in that moment, um, at that age, when I basically abandoned my parents, I was like, I'm 16. My parents are getting divorced. I'm going to just, I'm off. I'm, I'm kind of on my own. My dad was trying to figure out, you know, his situation as a newly divorced man and, and what he was doing and supporting me still under this household, but not really knowing how to run this household anymore. Um, I, and I say all that to give some context to like, my dad is the, most people talk very highly of their parents and they view them as a hero. Um, but like my father has never, this sounds so, so cliche and so uh, in a, like inappropriately wrong to say, but like, he's never perfect. done wrong. That's what this podcast he, is for. What, what is it? What? He's never done wrong. He's like a perfect man. It's, I, I mean, he, he gives money to his siblings if they need it. He, he, he's never yelled at me. And growing up, I got shit beat out. I mean, I got the wooden spoon or the leather belt on the butt, but never raised his voice. Never, never had to. And I, and I respect and healthily fear him more than, than in either of my parents growing up. My mom, she would chase me around the house and beat my ass for sure. She laid down the law. My dad was always poised and always wanted to be the loving, the loving side, very caring and thoughtful. So when my accident happened, I forgot about all that. I forgot that that's the type of character, that's the person that he is. And I just thought he was just my dad who needed to be my dad, needed to go to work, check in at the hospital, see how your son's doing. And that'd be it. But, um, you know, like I said earlier, and it was like that five, six, seven years later when I reflected and I said, well, what did my parents think at this moment? That's when I realized that I, the trauma was on my dad. The trauma was not my mom. It was not her figuring out, no, look, it's just an arm. It wasn't me losing my dominant arm at 13, whatever. I don't even know any better. I'm only had 13 years with this arm. It doesn't, in the grand scheme of things, it's a blip on the radar. The trauma was the guilty conscience associated with my father because he his was number one goal. Them. His number one goal was to protect Logan Aldridge. Like everything in safety. my life is about protecting my three boys. Everything is about safety. Yeah. And especially on a boat doing extreme sports where you're flying around in the air and then slinging people around, but you know, it's chaos on the water and so many unfortunate accidents happen. So especially on the boat, most cautious. And so for that to happen under his watch with you know, his wife, my mom on the boat with some family friends and other very young kids on the boat to witness this. He, it was really tough. It was really tough for him. And, and like, Do you know those kids still who were on the boat? Yeah. Yeah. Were they like, dude, that was some crazy shit. One was like a toddler and the other was I think seven or eight. Hey, that's um, probably yeah. the biggest story that ever happened in that person's life. That kid was very much, uh, scarred from that and now he's <laughs> now he's now he's one of the uh now he's a marine and i'm pretty sure he's special forces so i think he's turned that into he's uh, processing it yeah I think, so. I think so but yeah has your dad ever grabbed you and held you logan and said oh my god i'm so sorry or if i would give you my arm or have you guys had like just a face-to-face has he has he actually said anything to you about that day now that you're older We've talked about it. That's why, that's what I did, you know, six, seven years after when I was reflecting on the fact that I'd 
and living this long and I'm off into college. Uh, I remember, yeah, I talked to my dad, call my dad and be like, oh, what, what was this like for you when this happened? And, and, you know, he said it was very, it was a huge, it was a big struggle. We never had that moment of just like breaking down and me recognizing the blame he put on himself. But we had a conversation and, um, it was very enlightening to know that he struggled with that. And then the part that really upsets me is how he dealt with that. And then the burden of a divorce before there was any resolution or closure or communication about the previous guilty conscience and burden. Cause that's part of it, right? That's part of being and to not a father. Man. You don't want, you, you want to keep the family together for yeah. your kids and, and you want your kids to be safe. Yeah. It's a lot, man. It's cool um, that you had that um, talk yeah. with them. It's really cool. You had that talk with them. Wait till you have a kid. Then it's going to, your brain's going to just. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, I'm at the age where my friends are having kids and it's some of the coolest explanations you start to hear. And I know you've, you've said them all the most elegantly, frankly, but when people explain that, that the thing that happened, and I'm watching some Netflix documentary about babies and I'm learning all the science behind like the chemicals in our brain with men and obviously definitely women. What's the doc? I want to see it. What's oh, the babies? Doc? Babies. Okay. okay. It's incredible. Women's hippocampus forever changed. Like that whole motherly instinct thing, completely scientifically true. And then there is effects on men. So especially in that first year, if the father is, touching that child often changing diapers being present there is drastic chemical changes in the brain forever hey, a side note here real quick i don't think that mic in front of you is working i think the mic that i'm hearing is from your computer what do you think oh my. see i wish you wouldn't i wish you wouldn't have called me out because i'm that, <laughs> yes i'm, that I'm like how does it sound like that <laughs> i can't figure it out i spent 30 minutes before this podcast trying to figure this shit out you have a faux microphone. That's a fake microphone. You're just you're just a po- you're just being a poser right now. Logan. It looks good, man. I look like a pit crew. I could be a freaking sports commentator. I could be anything. When I I, I, I was really well in here. That's why I wear it. But I, you look great. Uh, after this show, I'm going to help you fix it. Please, please. Um, when I met when I met my wife, she was in college, so she's in her 20s. So I saw her as a college girl figuring out life and, and partying, and then I saw her turn into a, a, a young woman, then a woman, and then I saw her turn into a mom, and I got to witness all three phases. And man, was that just so Pleasure. much fun! Yeah. yeah, the mother wow. phase is the best. I mean, at least from from my wife, all that other crazy shit kind of goes away, and it's um. Oh, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying that. Um, but the mother phase is awesome. So, um, how many one-armed guys are there in the country, in the United States? 742. That really? No, I don't fucking know. Are you kidding me? <laughs> one of the interesting thing. One of the interesting things I heard you say. Um, so I and I remember. I remember hearing this years and years ago. So you don't know how many one arm guys there are in the country. No. Okay. Um, and there's not some weird stat you have like it's always the right arm that's gone. It's, you don't know any any weird one arm numbers or anything like that. No, no. Most okay. upper extremity amputations, though, if you're talking amputations, yeah, are due to traumatic. Most are due to traumatic injury, whereas most lower extremity amputations are due to uh, chronic disease, and illness, uh, diabetes, type yeah. two diabetes. Yeah. So I remember someone saying that they were in the prosthetic business and business was exploding, and their two biggest customers were motorcycle accidents and type two diabetes. And what I thought was, but but there was still no comparison. Type two diabetes was like causing the prosthetic industry to explode by far. Now the population of upper extremity people that I know. Uh, and there it is a lot. It is. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a valid question to ask. I can't put a number on it. I don't know statistics, but definitely uh, thousands, thousands and thousands that I know personally and network with. It is fascinating. And that's awesome that you say that because it is fascinating to me. The amount that are due to motorcycle accidents. Remarkable, like heavily, heavily outweighs any other type of accident or illness or injury. In terms of traumatic, well, not illness, in terms of traumatic accidents, illness is, the, you know, diabetes is the number one cause for amputations. And, and um, I the only guy I know who's in the orthotic and prosthetic industry. I studied. Say that again. Say that again. Sorry. 
I worked in orthotic and prosthetic industry. I stuck in college. I went to UNC Wilmington out here in North Carolina um, on at the beach. Very fitting. Go to the beach, go to class, wakeboard all day, no problems. I went to college um, on a beach town too. Man, it's amazing. Okay. Or I went to a beach town and did some college. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, and uh, and you don't I wear studied. one. You're saying you studied it, but you don't even wear one. I saw you had a yeah. video where like you were touting yeah. someone you had that was just all cables and shit. But yeah. then I look for videos of you wearing it, and there's nope. No. You're, you're a one arm guy. No. Yeah. So I studied. Um, I, I went to school for business. I was in the business school, but I I studied additive manufacturing, so 3D printing. I was very, very interested in that in college and did a lot of independent studies, went to a lot of different conferences on that sort of stuff because I saw a huge opportunity with uh, prosthetics and specifically the sockets and the fit, how that cross, how that artificial limb fits to a residual limb of an amputee. Uh, and this use of additive manufacturing was not only cost effective, um, a better fit, but also more comfortable and faster production. So it was like a win-win on every front. Why don't you wear one? Archaic. I don't wear one because I am an upper extremity above elbow amputee. And when you talk about above elbow, below elbow, above knee, below knee, those joints dictate a massive amount of functionality with the artificial you're going to wear. So look at, look at the, all right, our leg, what, if these were legs, what do they need to do? What does the knee really need to do? You need to be able to ambulate. So a prosthetic leg needs to help you walk. And that's at the base functionality. That's what it needs to do. So you can do this. So the knee needs to bend and allow some gait travel. And, you know, it gets complex, but pretty simple. Upper extremity, arms. You want to replace an arm? You want to replace an arm, a hand? Look at the shit we do with these things. <laughs> Look at this. Look at the how in the, I don't care where we're pretty advanced or, you know, we've come a long way with technology, but biomechanically we have not figured out all that. So you have a very uh, nice arm, by the way, you have a great arm. Oh, thank you. Maybe we blush. Appreciate that. Tattoos are new. Uh, so, so, so you didn't, you found it was being more hindrance. More one. Yeah. So here's, here's what happened. For you personally. Upper extremity. I had one. I had all of them. I had a hundred thousand dollar on. I had computers all in it. I could crush bottles and, you know, I was like freaking, um, I robot with that thing, but functionality wise, I was more disabled wearing it than not because it was a huge, heavy thing. And a strap went across and my armpit rubbed and I tried to pick it up and it would get, would knock over things. You know, it was just you now granted, maybe if I spent a lot of time practicing with it, I could have gotten better, but I'm under the impression that <clears throat> my native anatomy, I want to use this residual limb as much as I can. I want to desensitize my uh, distal end, so all the nerve endings that make it sensitive. And if you just wear a thing over it all the time, you lose the opportunity to do so. So <clears throat> prosthetics are training wheels. In my oh, opinion. you just gave a good reason why circumcision's bad. But with that different, different podcast, different <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I want to know where you're going to go with that, but there's a guy, there's a guy I see walking around my, my town about a mile from my house. I see him walking all the time and he has, he has no legs, but he's got legs. He's got two prosthetic legs Yeah. yeah. and he cruise and he cruises around and I, and he always wears like really short shorts, right? Like strutting his shit. Like, look at me, motherfucker. Yeah, and I, I want to go. And if he was wearing pants, I would never in, a, and it's hot where I'm at. If he was wearing pants in a million years, I would never know if he had prosthetic legs. I mean, maybe if I studied him, I might be like, Hey, something's up with his gait, but man, he moves good. And, um, would, would it be inappropriate if I walked up to him and just started talking to him about it? No, not at all. No, not at all. Not at all. I encourage that. You know, it's something, uh, it's funny when, you know. Because I want no, to, my brain no explodes right when I watch them. There's no right or wrong to this topic, but I, prefer, I encourage curiosity. I want kids who are staring at me in the grocery store to say, excuse me, sir, where's your arm? Like, I want that. Uh, I think it's an awesome teaching opportunity. And it's how, often does that, how often does that happen? Uh, very often, but most, and not that instance, what, what happens most often is I just hear it. It's not directed at me, but it's mommy, where's that man's arm? You know? And then the parent goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so that oh, please don't say that. And I'm like, no, that's a great question. 
I was at, I would, I would probably would have said something worse if I was that age, but that's awesome. Let me show you what this thing looks like. Look at this. I used to have an arm. I don't need more. I didn't eat my vegetables. This is what happens. Eat your vegetables. <laughs> have you said uh, that? Oh yeah, I'm definitely. I've done that. I've done that one. And the literally the parent looks at me and goes, Thank you. <laughs> I didn't listen to my mom. Yeah. Right. Right. So you know, I've had those instances and I encourage that. I think curiosity is key. I think it's cool to, to have kids or anyone. But what I find interesting is when somebody, even adults in conversation, you say, I don't mean to be rude, but what happened to your arm? It's like, why, why would that, why is that rude? Why would that be rude to be curious, to be so thoughtful, to want to know um, if anything did happen, how it did happen. I think what's happening is, and we talk about this in our adaptive training course is that like language is very important and we come as society from this ableist perspective of language whereas you see me and you immediately think i lost my mom so i'm missing something there's something that's not there that should be and there's a psychological effect that starts to happen where it means i'm less than that means i'm not normal yes, so i'm yes, abnormal yes yes and there's a lot that starts to happen with that and we talk about in our course the importance of person first language especially with disabled groups but really in any aspect of life right like What's that mean? Person first language. I was agreeing with you about like, like, yeah, people with two arms see you and they think, Oh, he's missing an arm. Yes. I have two arms and it's all relative. We only know what we know. Right. So we start yeah. comparing it to like a regular human being that has two arms and two legs, but there was some term you use there, especially person with first language. So one more so time. Person first language. Yeah. Well, so explain that to me. That's technical and, and you don't have to get lost in the semantics all the time, but that would be like saying instead of like, Oh, we have a deaf person in the class. It would, it would be, Oh, we have someone with a hearing impairment or someone who is deaf in our class. So it's putting the individual before the identification impairment or category, if you will. So a person in a wheelchair and rather than they're a wheelchair user. And so it's, it's subtle. And where we, where we break this rule is in fitness. We call, I refer to myself in this population, as adaptive athletes, right? Technically that breaks the person first language, but it has so much positive brevity to it. Like it's an empowering term. And frankly, what are we, what are we doing? Are we going to get lost in the fact that we've got to say 14 words just to say that this person is an adaptive athlete. It's a short term that works well, but technically what we should say is this is an adaptive, this is an athlete with adaptive needs. If we wanted to be technical with the psychology of language, then you're going to hate this next idea I have. So I'm, ty so I'm typing in your email and your email is uh, Logan at adaptive training And I'm thinking this motherfucker should just have Logan at one arm guy. <laughs> that's, it, a great, just, that's a great point. Yeah. It should just be, cause then I go back and I'm like, did I spell everything right? Am I missing everything? I'm thinking Logan, L O G A N at one A R M. Or just the shit. That's one it. Arm. One arm. At Logan one arm. at one arm. Com. I got. I bet you one arm. Com is taken. You better believe it. <laughs> <laughs> you already know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to tell you a story, and I don't know if this story is true, but it, I don't know if that matters. So there's, there's a friend of mine. He's not really a friend of mine, but I wish he was a friend of mine. And every time I see him, I hug him and I treat him like a friend. His name's Kyle Maynard. Do you know of him? He has oh, no yeah. arms and no legs. Of course. Of course. Okay. So, um, I heard he was giving a talk to a bunch of soldiers. This is the part that I don't know if, if it's true or not, but I heard he's giving a talk to a bunch of soldiers and um, he gets up there and the first thing he's, and they're all soldiers who've had like some shit happen to him, like a limb blown off or some, something happened to them. And he gets up there and the first thing he says is, man, I feel sorry for you guys. Have you heard yeah. this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, okay. So maybe yeah. it is true. By the way, I wish, yeah. is that the creatine fit aid? Yes. Yeah. God. Oh, all right. Oh. Flintstone vitamin, man. You ever take a Flintstone vitamin? Now it's in a can. Pre pre COVID, when I was balling, I was I had two cases of that coming to my house a month. <laughs> that's when that's when the luxuries I cut away. There you um, go. So you should be drinking his immunity aid right now if you're asking me. I'm just a I'm just a sucker for the word creatine. I just think I'm gonna get Dude, buff. Me too. Freaking, I stay this way. So I heard he gets up in front of all these people and he says yeah. what no other man in the world could say to them. Kyle Maynard says. 
I feel sorry for you guys. Cause I was born like this. You guys actually lost a limb and I'm just like, Holy shit. What? Like, I wish I could be in the room when he drops that bomb. That's so like, it, awesome. so that much is. power. He's, there's so much awesome. he's conveying to those people. He's like challenging them and yeah. empathizing them at the same time. Absolutely. When you look at your own life, you're, you lose the arm at 13 I mean, it is you lose the arm, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah, don't get wrapped up in this language thing, but it's just it's important to be aware of because you can understand how that can affect the psychology of something better. But yeah, absolutely, yeah, I lost my arm at thirteen. Yeah, it's it's um. And are you glad you had your arm? Do you ever think, or is this an irrelevant question? Um, do, are you glad you had your arm for the first thirteen years? No, I love this question. Um, I'm so glad I had it, and I'm so glad I lost it. Wow, I don't believe you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Are you kidding me? Do you see how weird I am? Do you notice how like I'm already a bit of a different type of person? I believe that to be true in myself way before losing an arm. Losing an arm? No, I don't have to even say anything. You don't even have to get to know me. You can just look at me and be like, that dude's different. Yeah. I think that is fucking awesome. I think everyone should want to be different than anybody they've ever known or seen. And I think that's awesome. I followed you on Instagram. I can't remember what the, f the first video I ever saw of you was, but I saw something and I'm like, holy shit, this guy's, this is fucking really cool. This guy has one arm and he did that. Like, I can't do that. And I have two fucking arms. Like, what the fuck? And then the first and only time I've seen you in person, I was like a fucking little girl. Just, do you remember where it was, where I saw you? I saw you on an airplane. Oh, was it airplane? We were headed out to Mass. Oh yeah, that doesn't count because that was okay, I was just that, was, that, was that one I was just kind of shocked I saw you because I had that, that one took me a second to piece together. That's the guy from Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I I saw you working the Fide booth at the CrossFit Games. Yeah, yeah. And I just got I couldn't believe it was you. <laughs> I was I was so excited, and you're right. There is something different about you. I'm pretty sure I had the same feeling about you, Svon. I don't think you're you have the blue check mark. All right, you're yeah. famous. You're famous. <laughs> mine's a prosthetic. Mine's a prosthetic. I'm cool. <laughs> it's a blue. It's a blue check mark. Uh -huh. yeah. Um. So we don't know how many one arm guys there are. We know that most people who have limbs missing, it's because of chronic disease. Um. We know that um, you were in that business and um, you were surprised at how many um, amputations there were from like motorcycle accidents and shit, yeah. right? So I, I would like to just, yeah, explain like, why, why am I here? Why, why do I do fitness? Why am I so into this? It's not just because I want to have a six pack and all that stuff. And throw in, there why you haven't, throw in there why you haven't done steroids. Yeah, well, you know, I don't know. I don't know why you assume that, but you know, that's another question. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Jesus, I'm why, kidding. Why I assume you haven't. Done. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's kind of mean to say that steroids. to someone. Why haven't you done steroids? I did not. Yeah, that you, came you across. assuming I haven't done steroids? I got, you think this is natural? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I want to tell you why I'm here. Um, in the orthotic and prosthetic industry, yeah, biggest epiphany was, wow, I thought I was going to meet people who just went through a boating accident, just went through a motorcycle accident and lost a limb and were these active go-getters or doing stuff already. And I was going to be the guy who said, hey, there's still a ton of opportunity and cool places to do things. There's resources, there's training regimens, there's equipment. I can help you create custom equipment with additive manufacturing, 3D printing. The reality of the situation was it's chronic disease. It's diabetes. People are coming in, barely hanging on to life. Unfortunately, they're resulting in a partial foot amputation. Nothing changes in their lifestyle. And that's a lot of socioeconomic factors. That's a lot of stuff outside of their control, frankly. But I don't believe is, that, but go on another subject. Lot, yes, but a lot is within their control. I do. I know where you're going to go with that. And I, uh, I was fascinated to see that I thought all throughout college that in the orthotic and prosthetic position for myself, not as a practitioner, but just for the role I was going to play, that I could add value and create a solution there. I quickly realized that I had pigeonholed myself. This is not at all where you create the solution. If I make a better fitting socket for someone who's 150 pounds overweight and has a horrible lifestyle and understanding of health and wellness generally, 
it does not matter how advanced or how creative the 3D printing machine is or that socket is, they're never going to wear it. They're going to continue to destroy their bodies. And the crazy statistic is once that diabetic patient has one leg amputated, there's a 90% chance the other leg will be amputated within five years. Wow. Is that true? Yes. Oh man. So that is so sad. That's one of the Ooh. saddest statistics. Yeah, that's you can, heavy. You can imagine. And that is frankly, I, I rest because on they don't statistic. change their lifestyle, right? Because no, they don't that, change their lifestyle. That statistic resonated with me for about a week. And, uh, and I quit. I was like, I'm not, this isn't where the solution happens. It happens in fitness and health and wellness before you have to resort to an orthotic or, pra- or prosthetic practitioner. Hashtag CrossFit. Amen. That's what I did. That's what I did. I, I was doing CrossFit on my own, in my own gym or whatever gyms with friends. In college, I weightlifted every day. Every day. The group of buddies, you know, I played on a club lacrosse team and my group of buddies, we went to the gym every day and we lifted like birds and that was fun. And I graduated and was working this job and, you know, seeing my life unfold of going to work in the morning, coming home at night, going to the gym, doing that. Uh, and realized that I wasn't making any friends, wasn't meeting any people. So I started going here in Raleigh, North Carolina, started going to all the affiliates. Uh, and there's a ton here. There's a lot per capita here. And I went into all of them and a lot of them were awesome. A lot of them were not, you know, it depends on who you, who you get in that moment, uh, whether it's owner or coach or something. Some people like not. Why did you go to a CrossFit gym? Because I've been doing these sorts of workouts. So you found see it. So you found it online first, and then started yeah. doing it. Okay, Dot same com. with me. Okay. Dot okay. com every day. Do okay. what's do what's there, and yep. just check the box. Go home. That's it. Okay. And I thought that was awesome, but I was super unfulfilled. Uh, you wanted to meet a girl, socially. is what I'm hearing. What yes. I mean is you want to meet a girl. I was super unfulfilled socially, and Tinder okay. was not cutting it. So okay. I had to go into a CrossFit box, and. Um, I went to all of them, but it was, it did not take long. It was the first gym I went to where I experienced a group class that I said, epiphany. I said, this is the answer. And not only is this the answer, but this is exactly what I've been saying since I lost my mind. Because I, I don't know if you know this about me, but I was a, a motivational speaker, a professional speaker at 14 and did that for many years throughout high school. Um, and all credit to my mother for believing in me to put me on a stage like that. Cause I never would have pursued that, but was very comfortable in doing so. Do not fear public speaking at all. I, I enjoyed it. I thrived in that environment. And all I did was just tell my story, break my story down into a template of how any challenge or crisis or issue in life, you can apply a similar uh, template to and have that same thought process and resolution in mind. Um, so after doing a lot of the speaking stuff, I started to, um, where was I going with this one? The gym, the gym. You started you oh, were yeah. going to gyms, at, hunting women. I was at this gym. I mean, yes. That's my so, interpretation. This is, this is the, yes, this is what I'm saying. When I finished the group class, I was like, what do I talk about when I speak about the importance of attitude and surrounding yourself with a community and believers and people that will support you and cheering on effort, not, you know, placement. And I am like, these sorts of things just unfolded in a 60 minute experience. And, and, and yeah, words were said, hi, I'm this person. Hi, I'm this person. Shake your hand. High five. And at the end. And that's when I said to me, myself, I said, a CrossFit class is a motivational keynote speech in one hour. You get to experience and embody what a presenter typically t- tries to tell you. No excuses. Never give up. Always push through. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. You know, all these terms and phrases and stuff. Uh, you know, must, the, 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 the teachers at the gym, you know? the teachers at the gym must have felt crazy pressure when you're in the class. You're sitting there rating them, okay, 3.2 on dress, 5.6 <laughs> on presentation. I'm, you know, motivation. I, I'm all about entertaining. I just want people to have a great time. I want to give them a great time. And, and this is when, you know, so yeah, I realized that immediately in CrossFit. Three months later, I was getting my L1. Um, and not at all to become a coach because wait a second. You're telling me an L one is applicable to a one arm guy. Can you believe that? Wait, no. Holy right. shit. I'm pretty sure I'm the first ever to do that. Tell me okay. about the L one. Cause I am a fucking fanboy. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And it's, it's, and as you should be. Uh, my L one was in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, it was, <laughs> it was awesome. 
It was great. And, uh, I remember some of the staff members, um, asking me to come out and demo to the group or they called me out. We were talking about burpees and, um, they called me out. I forget the exact context of it all, but, uh, other people in that group have told me this story to remind me of it, but they called me out and were like, so Logan, how do you do burpees? And I was like, I do exactly the same way you do that. And everyone else. And guess what? They suck just as bad that way. Like, I don't need to change anything about it. I just do it. And it wasn't me trying to be like, you know, uh, combative, combative or anything. I was just like, don't view me that way. I'm, I'm a fly on the wall here. I want to be learned and taught the same way you would teach any and everyone else. If you have some ideas or tips or tricks for some one arm stuff, love to hear that. And, um, who was it? Oh, I'm not going to remember his last name. Jason, not Fernandez, but our back. No, I know who you're talking about skinny dude, skinny dude. Oh, McDonald UFC oh. fighter. No, Jason. Shoot. I, I even meet him at the games every year. He, he's always in the booth with the CrossFit store area. And he's like, ah, man, I feel horrible for not knowing his name or his last name. Not as Anyways, bad as he feels. Not as bad as he, he feels. <laughs> he, he taught me something in that seminar. That is a teaching point. I teach in our adaptive training course now. And that was, we were going over the split technique. And on the split technique, I was like, all right, I, I definitely want to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go overhead. But what's happening with my feet? Like, I know we say if you're, you know, lefty, is this foot, righty, is this foot, what? But for me, like, I feel like it's not much of a choice. It's, it's kind of going to be a, a, a stability position issue here. And he didn't have the answer, but he thought through it with me. I'm like, let's think about that. All right, one arm up overhead. Let's take, if your right arm's overhead, what happens if your split position is your left foot forward? And we went into that position. And he did some like tactile stuff to try to see where I, where I feel unstable. And he was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. That, that's definitely not the right way. Or I don't think that's the right way. Let's try the other foot. So I put my right foot forward and my left foot back hand overhead. And it was night and day difference. Like he couldn't move. Me. He couldn't like, I was extremely solid. And so we developed reasons why that is right there on the spot. And he was like, well, that makes a lot of sense. If you go back to that other way, you t your, your body wants to open up because the, side bearing load your one arm bearing load has no support directly underneath it that's your back foot so you guys discovered position. something about fitness in the l1 have you, you ever that? seen that anywhere else so basically if you're doing a split jerk your the foot that goes forward is the same foot that the, is the arm that you have yes but and this goes a step further i'm not trying to is that true is that like biblical is that is that that is true that's like fitness like truth that is the truth we discovered in this moment. Okay. It, uh, I think it's contradictory. Okay. Because in the CrossFit Games this past year, they had to do single arm split. And it was, it was a rule that they had to do opposite legs. Oh. So it was the opposite to the standard we created in, through trial with me. And I thought that was very interesting. We, in the data community, we talked about that a lot. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, uh, I don't know if that was intentional to complexity and skill or, you know, weight, that weight is light enough that it really doesn't matter in terms of safety uh, in the movement, but like that's. Do you practice I both? I don't know. You just go right foot forward always. Yeah. If I'm doing, if I'm, if I'm doing like that, what they were doing, like a 70 pound dumbbell, I'll switch. But if I'm with a barbell, I'm taking a barbell overhead. It's right foot forward because right arm is bearing load. Yeah, that's crazy that you can do that with a barbell. That's Good fucking morning. nuts. Um, is it? Did I see that you had a 500-pound deadlift? That can't be true. I must have read that wrong, right? <coughs> Sorry. No, that is, that is correct. That is... Um, 160 pounds. Yeah, that is incredible. Tell me how, how, how many years were you deadlifting before you did that? Uh, two, three. You weigh 160 pounds. Yeah. How tall are you? Five eleven. What's an, what's a, what, do you know how much your, your arm weighs your right arm? Exactly. Yeah. If I had my other arm and I was just built and uh -huh. I'm like, I work out like this, this uh -huh. arm, I'd probably be close to almost 180. Really? You think that arm weighs 20 pounds? I mean, it's big, but let's not, let's not exaggerate. I mean, your yeah. biceps and forearm look big, but 20 pounds. 
Yeah. <laughs> they were saying when I was 13 and they took it off that that scrawny ass version of me, that that arm weighed like 10 pounds. No shit. Yeah. Our bone density, like we are, we are freaking heavy. I mean, obviously all of our weight is here. The majority of our weight's in our torso, but like. Ad- Adrian Bosman weighs 165 pounds. Yeah. He's got, he's got both arms. Yeah. He's, I don't think he's 5'11". I want to say he's 5'8". Were you ever fat? No. Because no. you're pretty shredded. Have you always had a, a nice physique? Yeah. Um, do you have a girlfriend? Fiance, yeah. Uh, oh, shit. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How she's, uh, she, she ran across the gym. Met her at a CrossFit gym. Does dropped she? Into, dropped into Cellar Fit Aid. And next thing you know, I was asking her out to a Jack Johnson concert. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That was, That's really cool. How was Jack Johnson? Oh, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I got to surf with him. I surfed with him in Hawaii uh, when I met Bethany Hamilton, the girl off from our shark attack. Oh, dude, right that's now. one of my favorite posts when you're over there, when you're doing yeah. that jump roping with her. Yeah. That is so awesome. So freaking cool. Any sparks, you, any realize- sparks between you guys? Any sparks between you guys? Be honest. Yes. Yeah, it looked like crazy no, sparks. I'm telling you. Not in that way, Savon. Don't be getting me. I'm trouble, just man. telling you. She's got just family and kid, and I, and I got fiance sitting in the other room. Right hey, you. Everyone can be married, and there can still be sparks. They were all coming off of her, not you. It's really cool, though. You know, that's a. Like, have you seen the movie Soul Surfer? I don't know if I have, but I'm, I've read a bunch of articles on her. And f- what's funny enough, the one time that I saw her was on an airplane. Also, I was going to Hawaii and she walked past me. No, um, Soul Surfer is like super Christian movie. Okay. I'm good with that. Maybe Most of my guests should, are super Christians. Maybe you should watch it because I get name dropped in it. She reads my letter. She, my letter after when my accident happened, my best friend at the time sent her a letter. Her, her accident happened nine months before mine fucking shark attack crazy so my accident happens and i was following the surfing circuit very well i knew her and alana blanchard very well i uh, played paid close attention to them because i i it, before losing my arm the day before losing my arm i was surfing i was out at the coast surfing surfed all the time i wasn't wakeboarding to surf very knowledgeable of her and so my accident happened my best friend wrote her a letter she was getting thousands of letters a day thousands and her brother was managing all of these letters and figuring out which one she should see or shouldn't see. And it's all portrayed in the movie to a T. It's so cool. But like, she's having like a really shitty time thinking she can get back into one arm surfing. She has a bad competition. She tries to go to and just gets wrecked and wrecked and wrecked. And she's like, I'm over this. I'm over this. And, uh, comes home and, and then she reads my letter that I wrote her saying like, Hey, you know, friend just lost his arm. He's in North Carolina. He's in eighth grade. And, and seeing you is inspiring him to, get back to wakeboarding and playing sports. So uh, that's so cool. So she, she made sure that the director of that movie put that part in because when my accident happened, she called me in the hospital. So in real, in real life, what? in real life, 16 years ago, when the accident happened, um, that letter was seen by her brother, Noah and her brother, Noah, in, when this was happening, turned to her and she read it and she called, um, she called my house while I was in the hospital. And my brother called the hospital and said, hey, dude, some one-armed surfer chick just called and left the voicemail. And so I listened to the voicemail, very short, just saying, hey, you know, I heard you just lost your arm, got a letter. Um, I just want you to know you're, you're going to be very capable to do whatever you did before. Uh, and were you like, high. shit, I'm already over this. My mom fixed my shit already. <laughs> too, yeah. little, too little, too late, Bethany. I mean, I mean, she was dicing on the cake. She was the one where I was like, hell like, yeah, who may, and who? it's not right. just me either. It's not just me. I'm not alone in this. And that's absolutely the case in anything in life. You're never alone, but it's easy uh, in trials and tribulations to feel isolated. And it was definitely easy as a 13-year-old kid doing all that. I'll just dock me out and be like, this which is arm only did, happening to me. Which arm did she lose? Do you know off the top of your head? Her left as well. And was she left-handed? No, she's right. Shit, her story ain't got nothing on yours. <laughs> you kidding me? The freaking that, beast of the ocean? Yeah, she's it, amazing. Her, it is her God, her story. I get so freaking jazzed up. About I'm gonna it, see the movie now, Soul Surfer. I'm gonna watch it tonight please. with my boys. And yes. then and they're yes. both on Netflix. Soul Surfer's on Netflix. And then God, I 
should be getting paid for this. And then Unstoppable, her, her other feature film that just came out, she okay. surfs freaking Jaws, man. She okay, goes out there and both. surfs that with Juan. Um, but yeah, so after she called me, uh, I got out of the hospital, got my stitches out, cleared to go back in water. We went out of Hawaii. I flew out there. My parents went out there. My friend who wrote the letter flew out there with us. So we all all, all went out there. Oh, out so you know her, her know her. Yeah, man, we're friends, we're friends, good friends. So we hung out. I taught her how to wakeboard. She never wakeboarded before. We got a wakeboard boat on the island in Kauai and went wakeboarding. She obviously taught me how to surf, gave me a lot of pointers on one on surfing. And um, yeah, man, we are in touch. I went out like three or four more times over the past – over the next two or three years after I accident. thought that was just some one arm publicity stunt to sell your to sell your jump rope. Oh my gosh. No, no. So let's yeah, talk about that jump organic. rope. Yeah. I think yeah. Dave should put that jump rope in the games. Yes. If I I love Not for one arm people, for two arm people. And I they gotta use it with one arm. When Dave has said that there has to be events that test skill, there has to be an unknown, unpracticed, untrained skill that's presented. And, you know, it used to be the pegboard, used to be the paddleboard, used to be some of this stuff. And now you're kind of like, where are you going to go with these skill things? What a cool organic way just to, just to throw out a little shout out to the adaptive training world by featuring something like the mono rope. You know, you where know, do I yeah, buy that? Today. I want to buy one right when we get off. Where do I go to buy that? Oh, that would be one. amazing, man. Yeah, RX Smart Gear sells it. So rxsmartgear.com. Are they the only ones who sell the one arm jumper? They sell it and Equip Products sells it. Which one do you use? I, I mean, Dave Newman, RX Mark here. His okay. Team. Oh, it's so, Dave. Yeah. That's right. He's yeah. awesome. Yeah, he's a man, dude. Yeah, yeah he is a awesome. man. Those things are awesome. Okay, and, I'm going to go on. Um, and I can just get it easily on the website. It's not like special order. I got it. Uh, yeah, okay. available on site, whatever colors you want and all that stuff. And yeah, man, we, we, you know, you know, I work, used to work for Fit Aid and we'd be at the booth and I would just whip that out. You know, when booth traffic was slowing down, I just whip that thing out and just do a couple double unders. Everyone would stop and be like, oh, let me, let me try that thing. And, uh, we already know how frustrated people can get with their jump rope. You give them this freaking bar and they want to snap it in half. It is so funny. Uh, it's comical for me. To watch what was the learning try. curve for you? Like, was it difficult? No, no. I, uh, so my invention of that was out of necessity. Uh, it was the open, it was the open 2015. I think it was 15.2 that had jumping rope in it. I was doing the scale version. So single unders, it was hundred single unders. And I went into the gym that day. Every day when I went to the gym, I was like, I'm going to be challenged today. Something's going to be on that board that I've never considered how to do. And I'm going to figure out, I'm going to look at someone who's an athlete doing it. I'm going to ask what, or, or observe what the stimulus, what happens to them when they're doing that, whether it was 10 burpees on the board. What does it look like if somebody finishes 10 burpees who's a fit person? And I'm going to attempt to adapt that in a way that's suitable for me and maximizes like my physiology and the stimulus that I can get. Uh, so if I can incorporate this, I would, but sometimes I'll just do things on. So for the jumping rope, for instance, I was like, okay, I get it. I know what that looks like and feels like for somebody with two arms. I don't need to watch somebody do it, but what's the movement pattern? What's really going on here? And what's the task accomplishment? Bounding on the ground, rope passing under you, hands out on the side, generating little circles from the wrists, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, okay, how do I mimic this? Well, maybe I can use uh, an object like a rig and with the appropriate jump rope, I can attach that handle into the side of the rig and mimic this motion by keeping this hand on the outside of me. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Tried that. Didn't work. Bad idea. Okay. You need both. If you have one oscillating point and not the other, it just gets all wonky and wobbly. Okay. Went home that night a little bit defeated, just kind of like racked my brain on like, it's got to be like jump and rope. Like, holy shit. I, I never thought I would have to jump rope again, but now that definitely makes sense. And what a cool thing to be able to do anywhere. I like, definitely need to figure this out. And like I told you, I played a ton of lacrosse. I went home, and that night, I thought again, what is the pattern doing? All right, if I can't get out here on this side, I don't have enough limb over here to try to attach a handle here. I know that's not going to work. That loop is going to hit me in the side of the head coming over. So I said, all right, if I can't be out here and jump rope, what if my one arm can be here, and I can do circles like this with a bar? And the way I was connecting these dots in my brain, and I was looking at lacrosse shafts that I have, in my room. So I literally picked one up, grabbed some athletic tape, stuck jump rope handles in on each side of the cross shaft, 
take, 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 take. Went in the next day, did 15.2 or whatever it was. Um, and did all the single unders unbroken. And that's when I was like, I am on to something here. Um, after that, it was just, all right, the next day, let's try double unders. And I got like, and did you take, and you took that idea to Dave Newman? So he is, he was working on something similar. He used that sort of design to help teach able-bodied people how to stay within this, this teaching point of jumping rope. You want to stay within this picture frame in this window. And he thought that was a great tool to bring elbows in. And it did for a little bit, but the application ended up being really useful for crystal, crystal, um, Cantu, another single arm female, single arm athlete on early on in the CrossFit scene. She was in, involved. And, um, crystal Cantu. Trying. Yeah. You remember her? I knew a Cantu and I knew a crystal, but I didn't know a crystal Cantu. <laughs> huh. Well, no, now you do right. So anyways, yeah. She, Lance, uh, I knew Lance can too. Uh, and I knew Crystal McReynolds. Oh. Uh, but no, but no. Anyway, okay. Strong names. Thank um, you. And uh, anyway. Good people, yeah. both good people, both yeah. good people. Yeah. So I did. I, I invented that for, for my knee and Dave had something similar. So we came together and said, you know, I was not in the business of starting a jump rope company. I was absolutely in the business of empowering people with one arm to do something they've never been able to do before or assume they could never do again. Um, so he manufactures, distributes the jump rope. I'm super fortunate to, you know, get jump ropes whenever I need them from him uh, and send them to people like Bethany and others that deserve them. Uh, do you think she's using them. it? Yeah, she loves it. She sends me videos all the time. Oh, that's she's awesome. My deadlift harness and stuff and a rowing handle. So I've invented a few other pieces of equipment, the, the deadlift harness I use and the rowing handle. So it allows you to row with one arm very comfortably. How old were you when you did your very, how old were you when you did your very first deadlift? See, it's hard for me to answer because I've always been an athlete growing up. My parents put me in sports performance camps, summer camps growing up where it was like literally like agility ladders and like vertimax machines, pre like Olympic lifts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is when I was like 10, 11 okay. years old, like very young kid. I'm just trying to think, how do you old. get to a 500 pound deadlift? I, I mean, I know guys who've been just know. training their whole life for a 400 pound deadlift. I really don't know. I really don't know. I remember, uh, well, here, here's, here's what I'll say. And this is going to sound salesy, but it's, it's true. Impossible without training, having trained and developed my, the symmetry of my posterior. If I deadlift with one arm all the time, no way. And, and to make it clear for the listeners or viewers, if you watch this deadlift is not done with me grabbing that bar in the middle with one arm and standing up. And I think you know that Simon, maybe you don't, yeah. but like it's, yeah, yeah, it's I know. my harness. So I'm, I'm using yeah. two points of contact. So I'm right. mimicking as much as I can symmetrical position on the deadlift. Um, and I never trained that way, you know, especially after 13, obviously. Right. Um, so when I got into CrossFit, I would say the first year almost of CrossFit was pure one arm, everything unilateral. So I was like, this is just the way it is. Let's, let me see what happens. Let me be a test subject and see what happens if I train unilaterally for a year. And I did. There was no, there was no problems. I've never had back issues. I've never had shoulder problems. Everybody tells me, you know, you got the keyboard warriors that like to tell me, you know, I'm not going to be able to put my arm over my head when I'm 50 or something, but like talk all you want. Um, I'm not lying as truthful as I can be when I say I've never had some sort of injury or issue from training this way. So I, 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 it was actually going to be one of the questions I asked eventually too, because you know, one of my hand, one of my elbows just the other day, I did 20 rope climbs, not legless, but I did 20 rope climbs pretty quick as fast as I could. And my elbow has been bothering me a little bit since then. And then on my other arm, my shoulder bothers me now and again. And I was just thinking to myself, man, when you got one, you can't, uh, does, does that creep into your head? Okay. I don't want to hurt this guy. This is my, this is my bread and butter. Uh, or you're too young for that. No, I, I think you are pretty it. young. I think about it, but like, what a, what a way to live your life. You right. Know? I agree. I mean, that would suck. I mean, at the CrossFit games, I did the one ton challenge. Are you familiar with that thing that was going on? No, but I think I saw you clean and jerk something crazy, like 200 pounds with one arm. Uh, two, 255. And then, two, um, yeah, that's nuts. I went that's for 265 and on the clean, I got caught underneath the bar pretty bad. And the bar did that, that classic thing where like, you know, pulls your wrist back. It like fell off my front rack, but my hand didn't get out of the way. 
So it bit my wrist back. So I have had in full transparency, a little bit of a wrist issue since then over the past yeah, make, I'm going to be honest. It makes me uncomfortable. Like when they had that guy riding the motorcycle at the CrossFit games doing flips. Yeah. I can't yeah. watch that shit. Yeah. And just watching, I watched an old video of you last night or two nights ago, putting up 200 pounds overhead with just yeah. like it was nothing. And I, I was just, you know, I felt my butt pucker a little. I'm like, Oh, I do wonder that though. I do wonder that. I, I appreciate that you say that. Like what is, what am I really showing the world? And this is what I fear. Like in that video, that 200 pound one, that one was, that one went, uh, I guess you'd call viral. Like it was on like Barstool Sports and all over the place. Oh my they God. You've been on Barstool? I couldn't believe it. Couldn't legend. Believe it. Legend. It. <laughs> <laughs> Were you naked? How do you get on there? Did when, you that, when that shit went viral, um, I, I was, it was very important to me to tell people that I did not just like willy nilly put this weight over my head. Like, I've been, it wasn't like, hold my beer, watch this. This has been like, Oh, I mean, I, granted, I haven't, it's, that's not been my goal my whole life, but like in some weird way, that's like my life's work as an athlete right. to be able to do that. Right. The way I trained after my accident in order to wakeboard the amount of training I did on grip strength so that I could ride sessions and compete and flip and spin by holding on to that handle. Like that's the only, I'm not the only reason, but like, that's why I succeed. I excel in CrossFit because I train like my whole mission was I'm going to have one arm. This one arm is going to be the strongest one arm anyone has ever seen. And that was for benefits of lacrosse. That was for the benefits of wakeboarding and the translation from that, trying to do a very two arm skill or sport with one arm was I developed some versions of some brute strength, I think, that I didn't realize I was developing and not necessarily through resistance training or weightlifting. It was just through action, through sport. I developed that. Uh, and I think that's why, you know, back to the, the deadlift thing, I think that and using my harness and training with that harness every time I could pull off the ground, introducing some symmetrical pulling coupled with the years of this sort of brute strength training of my hand and arm and, and shoulder, um, I think – through consistency, my body was just like, all right, let's, let's grow, let's grow, 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 get stronger, stronger. And see what happens. And There's an arm wrestler in Canada. His name's Vern Martell. He only has one arm. He is oh, a really? freak of nature, thin man with just a fucking like cannon like yours. Yeah. Like, like one of those fiddler crabs. <laughs> And I have a friend who has one leg and his leg is fucking so weird, strong. Like he can just do pistols. He can just do like, it is, it's uh you kind of can't get your head wrapped around it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I so I think I, that's what it is. People can't imagine you have 200 or 250 pounds over your head. Sorry, 255. And, uh, something seems, you, you know, you're watching it. So you're empathizing and you think you're doing it and you just feel your own personal arm, like snapping, you know what I yeah. mean? Because yeah. there's no, there's no real way to empathize what it's like to have only had one arm for 15 years and just train it exclusively. Right. And there's a lot of credit to people saying, uh, that's probably not the safest thing. Like that's very true statement. Right. Right. True statement. But, and, and then there's but a lot I'm not gonna live my what life. you're saying. I can't yeah. live my life like that. I'm 28. Yeah. I'm, I'm gotta, I gotta, I refuse. I refuse. Yeah. I'm so curious about what we as human beings are physically, but what I'm discovering as I get older, I'm actually really curious more about like mentally and socially and psychologically what we're capable of, but I'm absolutely fascinated with what we're physically capable of. Because yeah. I get to see examples every day. You know, I, my, my career is in adaptive training. I get to see examples of a T6 paraplegic, someone paralyzed them right at their pec, pec muscles doing ad mat sit-ups literally it defies medical science, like what they should be capable of doing. Um, and I see my example is pales in significance compared to cases and people I get to experience and work with. And like, when you realize that you, there's this whole, wow, that's so impressive what they did. It's, it's it doesn't become a wow factor anymore. It's like, fuck yeah, we're capable of that. Well, right. Hell yeah. Someone with no legs can. How about that freak? Of, how about that freak of nature? It's one of my favorite videos ever. I must've watched it a hundred times. That guy, I, I'm embarrassed. I can't remember his name, but he gets his wheelchair to the back of the truck. It was like three years ago. Oh, Zach, Zach rule. Yes. 
Yeah. I saw that he video. And I was just like, holy shit. What a, he's a savage. He's been like just, a, he bench pressed 500 pounds. So there's that. And then <laughs> he really is, dude. He is a savage. He is, you know, it was a birth defect for him. So he had to get his legs, you know, re- the portion of his messed up legs removed at like four years old. But that dude's family, like he would be like six, seven. He would be a monster. His hands are like the size of my entire chest. He's huge. Hilarious. Zach Rule. That dude is wild. Yeah. What a great, what a great, uh, what, what a great Instagram account. Have you ever had a moment, Logan, where you look up to the heavens and you start crying and you say, why me? Or it, I, I, I'm going to say, no, you haven't done that, but, but. I talk about this when I give, um, my, when I've given some keynotes, uh, about the importance of grief. Um, and the short answer really is no, but the detailed answer is apps. We all, it is a crit. I believe it is critical when you're trying to face a challenge or an obstacle or a traumatic, whatever, a thing in life, it's unknown, unforeseen. In reflection, there has to be a moment of grief. If it's a, if it's a bad thing, if it's a negative thing, you know, I, I lost my arm, right? Uh, and, you know, the word's just an arm, and I'm like, all right, things are going to be good, things are going to be good. You know, I'm like two weeks into like my two and a half week stay in the hospital, and uh, at, those, at that two weeks, you know, I, I've gone from – ICU to the pediatric ward. Now I'm just in the pediatric ward, just kind of making sure everything's feeling good before I get out. And it, and yeah, I had a, a moment of grief. I had a moment where I got up from bed late at night and saw my figure in the mirror for the first time, or it was the first time it like hit. I was like, oh my, I am what I used to think were like like scary cripple people. Like I am what I used to think was like. Well said. Yes. Like a, like a circus carny, like you did something and a drug and you, your arm got used too much and it fell off or something. I was like, I am now that negative association I've always seen. I'm the freak show. Yeah, exactly. That, that's a great way to say it. Yeah. And that was heavy. Um, then that's not what triggered the grief. That's not what triggered the emotional response, but it was that. And then, you know, this was before Facebook too, in 2004, this was when, they used a platform called care pages and care pages was like Facebook, but you would just say, this is my account. People would say, Oh, I'm thinking of you praying. So I recognized that and then sat in my, in my bed and my mom and I were reading through the most recent posts and they are friends, you know, eight, 12 and 13 year old boys, you know, that are friends of yours telling you, in a post that they love you and that they miss you and they're thinking about you and can't wait. Intimacy most 13 or 14 year old boys never have in an honesty. And in that moment, that's what triggered this emotional, Oh my God, I, I am a freak show, but all of my friends now look at how good people are. Like my grief came from, realizing how fortunate I am, how lucky I am, but also at the same time, how jaded I was in my perception of people with impairments. And so like, and now I deserve to have to live this way because I had that perspective you now. And, and, uh, it was like a 30 minute session. My mom and I balled our eyes out, balled our eyes out. I didn't, I never thought why me, why this happened to me? Not at all. Cause like I just said, like it, it actually, made it make more sense why it happened to me. But um, there was about a 30 minute session in that, and then we concluded that session with me saying, all right, I, I am promising myself that I'll never feel this way again. I'll never let myself feel this way again. Um, and that was, I, I don't I'm a huge ever. believer in suppressing deep feelings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever just pushed that shit way like down that before. And, Part, and, yeah. but it was true. It wasn't to suppress it, but it was, I just know like, I'm just busting the balls. This is useless, useless energy. Going, having the moment of grief is critical. If you skip that process and go to healing and then to recovery and then to whatever the steps may be for you, you are, destined to have some PTS, some issue, something that just, you can't create closure for unless you get, you really immerse yourself in the grief mindset. 
uh, Logan, um, the, there are thoughts. Our, our brains are these thoughts, right? They're these, they're yeah. these radios that are just playing, right? And this, and it's being transmitted from somewhere or it's coming from inside, whatever the fuck you want to believe. And then there's you and then there's me and then there's, and you can tell, you can come to yourself who is not your thoughts and tell your thoughts to stop. Yeah. You are not allowed in here anymore. I'm so it's a, it's a, but first you have to be, you have to be yourself. A thought can't tell a thought to go away. Now you got just some fucking weird echo chamber has yes. to be Aware. that, that yes. What'd you say? Awareness. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be this, this awareness that is you that tells that thought. Okay. I mean, man, people will live a whole lifetime and not know that trick. It's fucking amazing. But um, it sounds like you were write your own story. You can I'm just saying one more time. You can write your own story. You can change in your head. The narrative You're a Holocaust survivor. And you can write a story about you being a freaking war hero or whatever. It, it, you can turn that in it's the narrative into the best thing that could have happened. And like I said earlier, you know, losing my I'm so glad I did. It's the best thing that happened to me. It's just stories. And it's, it's balancing expectations versus reality. Like, we, we expect, we expect so much. And, I, and during this pandemic, there's a lot that happening in terms of uh, the realization that expectations are quite different um, and, and never guaranteed. And, and I say that because it's my, it's my life, my life. I lost an arm. And everybody said, all right, you lost your right arm. You lost your left arm, your dominant arm. You're probably not going to write again. I'm like, why, why can't I write again? Like, yeah. I know that I suck at it, but like, just give me some time. I'll get better at it eventually. And I did. But like, that was literally told to me in the hospital. I was given a laptop as I went into the eighth grade to take notes in school. I told, and I went about one week like that and I put the laptop away. I had note takers assigned to me in every class to provide me notes, handwritten notes. I told every single one of them, quit taking notes from me. I don't care. If I fail, I don't care. And they did and I started writing every day in class. And now my, and my teachers, I went to a very prestigious private school here in Raleigh, and my teachers had contact with my doctors, and they told them, like, yeah, he's probably not going to write for a long time, so you need to give him this assistance and guidance and all this stuff. And I shut all that shit down week one. And I said, I'm going to write, and that's the only way I'm going to learn is through writing. And I did. And a month later, I was writing with my right hand. And it's just an example of expectations. Setting the bar low for people is not good. That's no, horrible. If, if we accept the, this is Michael Jordan quote, if we accept the expectations of others, especially the negative ones, we'll never change the outcome. One of the I was told you have one arm, like you can't do push-ups. I'm just never going to do a push-up. When, when I was um, 16 years old, 16, 17, God, I don't remember. But it was probably one of the most memorable evenings of my life. I had had a girlfriend for a year and we had some alone time and I reached into the back of her shirt and I unsnapped her bra with one hand. I'm it was my first bra shirt. I ever unsnapped and I did it with one hand. It was like opening like I, would, I, I remember actually having this thought. This is like better than the first 16 Christmases I had. This is, there's no present better yeah, yeah. than... Then, and cool actually when I, when I, uh, the, the, the demented soul that I am, every time I see you, I'm like, I can do that. I can, I, I can, take a bro I can, the most important present in the world. I can unwrap that with one hand. <laughs> the ones hey, with the hooks are a little more right. different. That's the ones right, with the hooks though. are a little more difficult, but you can still do it. You can squeeze it. Oh like yeah, yeah, yeah. You can totally do it. Totally do it. It's just a flick of the, flick of the fingers. That's it. Have you had COVID? No. Cause I see you doing some really bad practices. I saw the way you tie shoes and you have to step on your lace with your other shoe. Mm. That's a lot of germs flying around, buddy. It's all over the place, man. You see how I shoot a bow? I'm, I <laughs> with your it. mouth? I bite it. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that. So it's COVID all over that shit. And you know, by the way, I have no germ fears, by the way, that was complete sarcasm. So let's talk about that bow. I saw you grab the bow with your mouth. I did see that. And I saw yeah. you shoot the coveted fit aid. That's disgusting. You should have to do jail time for putting a hole in a fit eight. I know, right? Being that I don't have any. 
It was a, it was a good harvest. <laughs> um, next time shoot an empty one or fill it with water, please. You make it a profit. <laughs> how doesn't that hurt your teeth or is the tension on the bow? I mean, I know Josh Bridges can't do that shit. I mean, how does that hurt your teeth? No, not at all. I don't, I go to the dentist. They say it's no problem. Uh, I have a pull weight on that bow of 45 pounds. Um, I shot 60 and six and 45 legally. I can go hunt with that, but I don't, I really do just target shooting. Um, but as oh, you can imagine, a certain like, amount of tension so that you can prove that you can kill the animal or something. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. If you're below 45 pounds, the, and, and pull this change is different on what it sends, obviously, but okay. if you're below that, then the arrow is with the cambers. It's not going to be able to go fast enough for a, a healthy kill. So yeah, you've got to have at least 45 pound draw weight. I made a hunt. post on Instagram suggesting that you and Josh Bridges fight. Did you, did you ever consider that or did you just let that kind of slide by? I would love to. <laughs> awesome. He's always challenging me to fight and I'm not going to fight him, but someone else needs to fight him. And then I just was like, shit. Uh, I love that man. I revere him. I've never actually met him. I've been like in the room that he's in and that's an awesome moment, but I know you two are very close. So if you can uh, help orchestrate that, I will make it. Hey. So basically you're saying if the only way you can meet him is in the ring, you'll do it. Let's do it. Let's All do right. It. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, mo it, so now I'm going to start just hammering you with my questions because we're getting late. Yeah. And I have something I want to talk about on here. So you can okay. give me a chance to talk about something later. Okay. You're, I'm going to ask you this one question and then you can go straight to that. So you did, you were way into lacrosse and there's a lot of cool videos of you actually on, on YouTube and on the web of you um, managing that lacrosse stick. I don't know shit about lacrosse, but it's obvious you're very proficient and it looks like ballet. It's beautiful watching you move the stick. Oh, um, you. And then you were doing wakeboarding. I didn't see any videos of that, but then it also said you were going to do motocross. Yeah. Once again, yeah. like I get really uncomfortable about that. I'm like, why the fuck is this guy? Why would this guy want to get on a goddamn motorcycle? Yeah, I don't. I, I don't oh, okay, want good. a. I don't want to get on the streets with a motorcycle. Okay. Uh, I, there's a rebellious part of my brain that wants to, but I look at the data. I feel like I told you, <laughs> right. all my one-armed friends lost them on motorcycles. Like I'm not trying to. That's where I'll draw the line. With, like I'm not trying to lose this one. But the motocross, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I raced motocross before my accident, like the very young 50 cc, like little pocket bike uh, division. Um, and frankly, that was a, a, a reason I had to do it again was to prove to myself that I can. Okay. I didn't need to go race again. I didn't need to do any of that, but I needed to be on at least like 125 cc, like full size bike and do what I need to do to ride some laps, to jump a hundred foot jump at the, you know, the finish line triple. Like I, that was my goal. To to you did that. that with one arm? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So with the bike, it's super easy. Actually, you just, you, you put a, what's called a GPR hydraulic steering dampener onto the tree of the bicycle or the motorbike. And so this allows you to have one through 10, uh, stiffness on the bars. So I also did a lot of like hair scrambles. So, you know, when you ride through the woods with your bike and all that oh, stuff, okay. you get the bar busters on your bars so that you don't hit your hands, but I started off with that to get a lot of control with one arm on the bike. So that made when that was the way I was introduced to riding with one arm. Was that made for one, one arm guys? No, it's just made for like okay. extreme downhill okay. racers. So. People who just can't afford yeah. speed wobbles. Yeah. Okay. So what, I did that and this is like, this was a freaking plush setup. You do that and then you just convert the twist throttle to a thumb throttle. So okay. To a mongoose thumb throttle. Surprise. Like a jet ski, right? Remember these brands. Yeah. Like a jet ski. Thumb throttle. And then that was game changer because now I could actually get some purchase on the, the handle and hold pretty well and just have here for acceleration. And then these two fingers, front brake, clutch. So you flip the front brake over and you stack it on top to be up high. The clutch down below with the middle finger. So clutch, you know, foot shift and then gas. And Can like you that. still do that? Is that an automatic response for you if you were to do that today? Like, do you own a motorcycle Absolutely. now? Absolutely. No, I don't. Uh, I, if I did, that's, that setup would be a go-to. I have a downhill or a mountain bike, you know, full suspension mountain bike, do that stuff as well. Similar setup, a steering dampener goes right into the thing, a different brand, it's called a Hopi steering stabilizer. That goes right into the, the, the tree there, gives you the same sort of range. Um, and then similarly, I just flip, 
the front brake over. So I just got two brakes. Actually, for the bike, I convert it into one. So it's a splitter. So it's 60% rear, 40% front. When you Sound, squeeze one brake. Sounds expensive. It does be a little pricey. Okay, tell me, what do you want to talk about? So I wanted to talk about what I'm doing now. Okay. What I've done throughout this pandemic. Okay. Uh, and the, the excitement I've had with it. Tell me. <laughs> what pandemic? The chronic disease epidemic? Epidemic. Tell me. So what are you doing now? You're, you're just all cloistered at home on an, on an so, assault bike, I imagine. As you were aware, I used to work for Life Aid Beverage Company, Fit It. Okay. Uh, awesome company. Love those guys to death. Uh, and I was in... Yeah, I've, I've been on seminar staff with our adaptive training course. You know, CrossFit used to own this course. We used to be a specialty course. So I was a red shirt under the CrossFit umbrella with a course. When all this restructuring happened and we became an ent entity, it was scary, but the best thing that could have happened to us. So I am just um, so excited about what I just busted my ass to produce. And I was just hopeful that you'd give me the opportunity to talk about it on you. Tell me, tell me, uh, tell me. I'm adaptive, excited. Adaptive Training Academy. I apologize. It's a long email, but it filters out those who pay attention to detail or not, you know, so it helps. But so Adaptive Training Academy is the company that, or the organization that came about after we separated from CrossFit. And we're still their preferred course. We still pay the affiliation to be the preferred course. But um, we've had such exciting expansion from um, being our own entity. And what I mean by that is uh, through this time, we took our education into an online format, similarly to how CrossFit did with the level one. Um, and we did it so much so with uh, respect and appreciation of our association and affiliation with CrossFit that we use the same authoring system that CrossFit uses. And in, this, in other words, when you take our course, you're using the same program platform. that yeah platform that crossfit uses rise 360 and then we've spent what would have took us six months to develop we did in three weeks my my partner at, with ata alex zirkenbach a seminar staff member he lives out in san diego um he flew out here to north carolina with me and for three weeks we spent like literally 20 hour days editing coding shooting video i am I appreciate everything that you do, Savannah, but I am not that type of person. And I constantly found myself thinking like, is this the kind of shit Savannah's super good at? Because like, oh my God, now I understand Some tedious why. shit, right? Some now I understand shit. why that is such a high value position because I never so close to tears realizing you're, you get this one thing done and you have like 67 more of those to do. And you know, that one thing took you three days of the most meticulous work you've ever done. Uh, and so it was incredible, incredibly rewarding. So we launched at the beginning of May, the online course, um, and our feedback has been remarkable. Uh, our adaptive and inclusive training online course teaches an athlete, uh, an affiliate owner, um, a coach at that affiliate, uh, anyone, how to work with adaptive athletes appropriately, how to look at an ableist perspective like we talked about, a workout, an RX workout on CrossFit.com. How do you host a class, a group setting, and make sure that someone who rolls in in a wheelchair feels included in that environment for the psychology and that importance of community, but also gets an effective and safe workout in? That's what we do in our course. That's what we teach. So I'm very happy with what we produce, and I just wanted to use your platform as an opportunity to share with the listeners that if they are an educator, if they are a physical therapist, occupational therapist, rec therapist, CrossFit coach, athlete, participant, and you're interested or you have your level one, you probably, you might not believe me on this, Savan, but I strongly I believe, believe, I strongly believe the very next form of continuing ed after your level one should be this adaptive and inclusive training. You know why I think so? Why, why I'm just like really feeling you here? Is it actually has nothing to do with people who've lost a limb? No, it's for it has to do ankles. with. Pardon me. It's for sprained ankles. Yes, for and rotator. people who are 100 pounds, and the people who are 100 pounds overweight. Absolutely. The stuff I'm assuming I have not taken your course that I could learn is so applicable to people who've put on so much weight that they've crippled themselves. Absolutely. And boy, man, if 
if civilization is going to survive, we can't do another COVID. I'm so glad so we, either, so we either have to let those people die or we have to fucking fully, fully like roll out the red carpet into the CrossFit box or into the healing center. So people can get off the refined carbohydrates and sugar. And what do you do? You take this CrossFit adaptive training course and they show you how to deal with people who can't fucking touch their shoes, who can't lay on the ground and stand up. Yeah. I'm feeling you, dude. Dude, it is spot on, Savan. And I am grateful for the opportunity to share that on your podcast. Cause that's not what we've gotten on some podcasts. It's been great to talk about it and all that, but no one's going to make it to the end. You waited too long. On this. It's always focused on, Oh, great. Now more wheelchair athletes and one arm athletes can come in. Yes. It's what we're teaching you. We teach you that specifically how to work with those populations. But the overarching principles, methodology, and theme of our education is if you hit it on the head, it's fun. Like, and that is what this world needs more than ever right now. Is the word handicap a bad word? Yeah, don't use that word. Okay. Um, use like accessible, because what would you use that word? Like handicap parking, like is this gym handicap accessible? You would just say, is this gym accessible? Right, okay. Um, I think the world has more gyms. people. I think the world, I don't know what the word is. I'm going to let you pick the word. I think the world has more people who are disabled. Ha- disabled than abled because of, and, and, and not people like you who were in an accident, but people who've made fucking lifestyle choices for 30 years that have disabled them. Yeah. That's a statistic I can, I can share with you. There's one in five people have a permanent disability. Yeah. And imagine well, the ones that are permanent. Statistic. You could fix people. You could fix people who don't have permanent disabilities, yeah. but man, they better fucking get on the bandwagon now. Exactly. And Why should we'll turn permanent? Five people have a disability yet if i asked you or someone else we probably don't know of an immediate person one out of five people that yeah we know why is probably that doesn't have a disability why is that because culturally socially we have isolated them you don't you, we don't our world isn't accessible our world is oh. inclusive so oh. they stay home why would they come out why would they be involved in community events right and you're no, there's your hermit. Yeah. Your hermit. Okay. So this course leads you to inclusive and accessibility in the gym space. But frankly, we're trying to create change on a much bigger platform than in the gyms, but in the gyms is where it starts. Just like I had the epiphany that it wasn't in the orthotic and prosthetic in, in industry for people with disabilities. For creating a healthier world, a world where we can live in healthcare isn't, so reliant on we have to focus on the fitness first crossfit health is in a weird way exactly what adaptive training academy is doing right we're focusing on a niche population to remind you that this is applicable to anyone who is in a situation where they have some sort of limitation that affects work capacity Mm. That's all that it is. Mm. That's our definition of an adaptive athlete is a person with a cognitive or physiological impairment that causes limitations, which are the limitations are observable and measurable. If you ask them to do something, you'd be able to witness this. So, and obesity could be that. Absolutely. Which then affects work capacity. Do, our do goal get- as a trainer, and you know this, this is all that I want to yeah, tell Our me. The trainer is to increase work capacity and decrease the limitation. There's not much we can do about impairment unless it's temporary. For instance, my fiance, she sprained her ankle this past week and really bad. Like, we have to go to urgent care and all this stuff. So she's temporarily impaired. Did she get she the said, COVID? Did she get the COVID? No, God, no, she got the COVID. Oh, she went to the hospital. I mean, that's where they're handing that shit out. We're super healthy here. And we have <laughs> CrossFit, so we're immune. And so. <laughs> And, and you have a healthy diet. Look doing, at you. You have a healthy doing, diet. Yeah, well, no, no. You don't. You don't. You don't want to say that about me. I eat a pint of Ben and Jerry's every night. Do you really? Yeah, man. I can't gain weight. Hey, that's because you're 28. You better stop. I'm telling you that shit. You will catch up to you. I can't wait. I can't wait to be overweight and have a reason to go work out every day. <laughs> so, so uh, g- going back saying, are you tired? Yeah, are you I, tired? I, I, Do you want to be on the podcast as the, as just a guy and not the one arm guy? Like, fuck this. One arm bullshit. Yes. 
I guess my mission is so that the next generation, you, it's not, it's not a superhuman to be one arm and be super fit. It's not out of the ordinary and it, it's, it's respected and they should be given the platform of professionalism as an athlete, but it's not hand clapping. Oh my gosh, you have one arm and you work out. That's so inspiring. I'm so inspired. You go to the grocery <laughs> store and you take all of your groceries to your car by yourself with one arm. That is so inspiring. Do you have to go Fuck pee? Can I help that. you with your buckle? Can I help Fuck you with your buckle? That, man. Fuck that. See, hey. like, that's the world. And that's what I call hand but, clapping events. But here's the thing. I'm 48 and I still can't stop staring at you. And it's not because you have a great body and because you have big arms and because you're good looking. It's because you're missing a fucking arm and my fucking brain can't get fucking wrapped around it. I just have to, I stare, I look at you, then I look away and I look again. There's something in my brain that just wants to, um, I believe that totally. You know what I mean? Like I'm I'm the same, I'm the same way, but if that's you walk by the mirror and you're like, what the fuck? Look at that shit. This little chicken wing hanging off my shoulder. But if that's the case where we don't get the recognition that general public deems we deserve, And I say we, and I don't like to do that. I don't like to go down this hole of like, we need more spotlight. We deserve this. But this is at the root of my passion. I believe that what a Paralympic gold medalist should receive the same exposure and everything that an Olympic gold medalist receives. Why is it so downplayed? And and there's a lot of, I I know a lot of answers to questions, but like that's, Okay, how about this? Why is a LeBron James better than a one-armed LeBron James? Or well, a one-armed wheelchair LeBron James would be a, if the one-armed LeBron James would be. Well, the the, the, MVP, the LeBron James of wheelchair basketball. Why isn't that dude set up with a Nike sponsorship and and because media? Because we don't cover it, we don't make right. it important, we don't right. put it on the television. So, but you're saying as like we want you can't help but stare, you can't help but look at that. Right. Like when, like when CrossFit started and the women were doing stuff that only men could do 10 years earlier, the women right. kind of stole or like, and like now they're kind of stealing the show. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. uh, um, um, well, how about this? How about a business that has a, um, sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but yeah, I mean to put you on the spot. How about a business that doesn't have a, a handicap or sorry, doesn't have a ramp, a disabled ramp. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm learning the vernacular yeah. doesn't have a disabled ramp, but can't afford a disabled ramp. And so they shut it down. Does that happen? Yeah. No, just yeah. any place, a place that sells incense and bongs. Like just imagine oh. a store that only has stairs going up to it. And there's a complaint. I mean, does that, I, I, I hear about that shit happening. Like in Berkeley, I'm from Berkeley and I hear right. about stores getting shut down because they don't provide access to it's disabled people. And I'm like, this is fucking yeah. crazy. This, this is store owner can't make more than 50,000 a year. And they're being, they're being pressured to put in a $50,000 ramp. Like what, yeah. what's that's, I don't know all the details on that. But when you defend build, your you community, to, Logan, defend your community. You have to build things to code. All right. Now there's certain code that helps that takes into account people in wheelchairs. Right. Um, but I'm not under the impression that every place in this world is going to make sure that they've made themselves accessible for people with impairments, permanent impairments or disabilities, I should say. So like, it is going to happen, but we can, we can limit that a lot and we can create, first of all, awareness, awareness starts with education. And until we're educated and we know it's a problem, then we're never going to fix it. We're never going to pay attention to it. And you're right. Like more, more uppity places. You'll, you might get uh, someone who feels that they're being shunned from this community because you're not accessible. And I'm sure there are court cases where it's absolutely positioned to be like, yeah, I was denied my right of uh, entry or inclusion into this thing ends up becoming a whole lawsuit or whatever. But I don't think that's the intention of people. People are trying to be, people with impairments aren't trying to be spiteful. They're just trying to create some awareness. They're just trying to say, Hey, I'm a person too. I'd like to be involved or considered. And that's not always going to be easily done, but it's a dialogue that we should be open to having and it should be totally understood why we would have it. It's definitely a dialogue we should be willing to have. 
I love the fact if this podcast only revealed one thing is that you were in the, you were doing the right thing by going into the prosthetic um, business because you yourself had one arm and you wanted to make it a better life for people with one arm. And instead of going down that, continuing down that road, when you realized that wasn't where you could have the most impact, the most impact you could have would be to teach people personal responsibility which is, Hey, you can do this on your own, not even taking a dig. You didn't take a dig at prosthetics, no. but you felt like the better way to help people um, who were uh, cha- challenged um, l- like you, you know, at 13, they had, they had, they lost an arm um, was to um, it's, it's sort of the Gandhi thing. You're going to teach them. You're not going to give them a fish. You're going to teach them how to fish. Absolutely. Their whole, and I just think that that's, if there's and one power. thing to take away from this podcast, it's like, that's really hard to do. Imagine you own 20 McDonald's and then you realize killing animals was wrong and you wanted to be vegan. How would you give up those millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars? Right. And you were on your path and your passion and you pivoted and you, and you walked the walk. That's a really great way of saying it, frankly. I've never heard it said so elegantly, but uh, that's very true. I, I, I don't care about me being able to clean whatever weight or deadlift whatever weight. I don't care. Uh, I am competitive. I'm very competitive. You seem very competitive. Uh, How do you wash so, your hand? How do you so, wash your hand? Uh, see, I just kind of don't. <laughs> you, you really your hand is just it's just a giant viral load there's no this is exactly why i haven't gotten covered because my immune system is extremely strong so i that. in the shower i know how you wash it you 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 rub it on yourself mm-hmm. no seriously if i wash it's it's this it's a, it's finger dexterity so it's like a palm fingers all the way up in the palm and then thumb comes on my backside. Wow. Oh, you should watch the YouTube of this people. This is wow. That's how I do it. Now I know why your fiance is with you. Wow. <laughs> that is, that is incredible. <laughs> um, the first time you had to wipe your butt with your other hand because you lost your, you I were, know what you're really asking. Your left. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. I you were too young. <laughs> we were too, you were too young. You were, by the time you needed that right hand, you were, you were proficient in it. Um, when you w- was, was, were things like that weird in all seriousness, you're left handed, you lose your left hand. Like is it, are, it, it, wiping your butt? Is that an issue or no? You quickly, you, it's no joke. You concentrate and buckle down and get it done. Yeah. You don't, yeah. You don't lollygag around there. Uh, <laughs> No, things like that I don't remember being a problem. Like brushing my teeth, I remember being like, oh, how do I do this? And then once I figured out how to put the toothpaste on the toothbrush, I was like, oh, this feels like weird with this arm. You know, like it's kind of dangerous. I've actually done that. Tried to brush my teeth with my left hand and I'm right handed. Yeah. And it's dangerous. If you're not concentrating, you could fucking yeah, you jack yourself in the mouth or something. Yeah. How many times a week does that happen where you're putting tooth on the tooth, tooth, toothpaste on the toothbrush and you miss or it lands in the sink or? Never. Because no. it happens. I have both hands and it happens to me once a week. You know, it's an interesting thing about being someone who's attempting to live independently with a disability. Uh, I can speak to myself pretty adeptly, but like having one arm and trying to accomplish the same task that you do. I will probably give that task a lot more close attention than you ever would because I'm having to recreate the structure of the way in which I do it. If, you, if, if that makes any sense, you know, it's called, that, if, it's called being present. Exactly. With that example of brushing teeth, like I'm very present. I, what I do, I have an electric toothbrush now. And so it has a larger hand. Fucking cheater. <laughs> Fucking cheater. I knew we were going to get to the bottom. Hey, man, you got to be adaptive, you know, D- adapt to your surroundings. So I put it under my armpit and I just hold it like that. So then the toothbrush has right here and I just put a little toothpaste on it there. Put the toothpaste down, pick up the toothbrush. I have an amazing video of someone brushing their teeth. I'm going to send you uh, when this call is done. Why are you laughing? Have you seen it? 
No, I no, I just can't imagine what I'm, what could be amazing about someone brushing their teeth. It's amazing. It's making its way around. Um, I have enough questions to do a whole nother show. I think I should like. Man, this is the craziest part. Yes. I don't, I've never been diagnosed with ADD or ADHD. Mm -hmm. I feel like I definitely have it, but I've never been diagnosed with it. I've tested a lot as a kid and they were always like, no, it's great. Great one. But I say that to say, I feel like you, you gave me like a little lead on a story and I never got to finish the story. I feel like I Tell me which like, one, which one There's probably know. 20. I don't even know. I don't even remember. There were so many topics. Where were we? People all the time will be like, dude, you started this and you never came back and wrapped it up. Yeah, was it the, was it why, taking a girl's bra off? That's why I, I, I love talk about that to you though, because I jump around like that in my head too. <laughs> the, the only topic I'd like to get back to is, is if taking the girl's bra off. That is a good one. <sighs> have girls ever dated you just because you have one arm? <laughs> just, they want to just try it out. No. Well, I don't know. Maybe that's I mean, it's as valid as any reason. Maybe that's what her intentions were. Maybe you're unboxing some stuff right now for me that I didn't realize. You definitely, lo you definitely love the attention. And, I love it, yeah. And there would be no other way to do it because the other side of it's fucking a nightmare to yeah. not like the attention. Yeah. But if well, you, you know, I want to be respectful too of, uh, like you said this earlier about Kyle, like, there's a lot of people in this community, uh, adaptive CrossFit, uh, that were born that way. You know, they don't know any different. They don't mean to be, Hey, look at me. Hey, look at me. I can do this with, I can do this movement. And I, I just lifted this much weight. They're just doing them. They're just doing their normal. And a lot of that is like character and behavior and personality. Like, are you the type of person that wants to be putting all that stuff out there? Or are you just more close? closed in close to the heart with your information and stuff. But like, you know, I think that's an interesting thing because yeah, if people who are born in such a way don't feel like they're missing anything or the psychology is so much different. Um, well, yeah. I, I, I will see us making this movement, you know, and this, this creating this platform and this empowerment and education, adaptive education, training competitions and all that. And, I just, can uh, anyone, can anyone be like you and Bethany and be like, so you guys are both beautiful. You both have these followings. You both have these platforms. You both have nice bodies. You guys both live this positive life. You both like, and it's like, yeah, that's why, that's why I invited you to be on the podcast. If you were 40 pounds overweight and sitting on the couch and feeling sorry for yourself without an arm, I wouldn't have fucking had you on. Right. Maybe right. I would have. <laughs> it would have been a, yeah. So that, could have been been, insightful. that could have been interesting. That actually would have been great. Um, uh, you were saying earlier, this, and this is kind of a good note to finish up on. Uh, what advice do you have for people like uh, um, who might be feeling sorry for themselves, whether they, and I'm not talking about people who, who are disabled or ambulatory or not ambulatory, or I'm just talking about like, what is, and we started the show saying you could write your own story. There's a time you can flip the script. There's moments where you can change. There was a word you used perspective how do I do that? How do I change my perspective so I can get on that road to being as happy and as beautiful as you and Bethany and myself? Great question. First of all, I think you need to uh, set your reality and understand uh, something I alluded to earlier, like what expectations are doing for your psychology, for yourself. I believe expectations are prejudgments that we make. Um, on ourselves and others that typically limit our potential. So once we look at that or, or think about that definition of an expectation, we expect something to be something, uh, we expect someone to do something for us later or do something and it will be this way. And if it's not, then we've either had our, we're either let down or we're elated. So it's typically, it's always that way. It's either like, dang, you didn't do what I thought or why you did way more than what I thought. So it's black and white in that way. Um, for perspective wise, once we understand that expectations are always there presented in our consciousness, but are never fulfilled perfectly. And then we think about the lens in which we look at the world or the, the, that event or that expectation um, for perspective. My favorite tool is literally just, it's a practice. It's, it's words, changing words. 
change your have tos to get tos. That's it. And any any part. Change your what? Say that again. I missed that. Change your change your have tos to get tos. You have don't tos you to don't get have to do anything. You may think I have to take out the trash. You may think I have to go to work. But if you replace that with I get to take out the trash. I get to go to work. Babe, I have to go talk to Logan Aldridge right now. I know oh, it was, so, it was such an exciting thought yesterday or two days ago when I called him, but now I just want to play in the yard with the kids. But I have to do it. That's where I was fucking up. I should have been like, I get to talk get to Logan to Aldridge. Work. Okay, I'm feeling you. I'm feeling see, you. Man, you see what happens? All you yeah. do is check one word. You oh my God, that. I get to talk to Logan. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like it, it already is, better. It's, that, it's the same trigger that it's just an arm did for my brain. And it helps fix my anxiety too. I'm already less anxious thinking of it that way. I get, I get to do another podcast. I'm so stoked because usually, I mean, that is really working for me because when I'm, when it's 11 o'clock at night and I've had two white claws and I'm working on my third, I'm like, fuck this dude, Logan's awesome. I'm getting on the podcast and come in the morning. I'm like, Oh, what the fuck did I, (laughs) I scheduled a podcast with someone. I'm so scared. I know that was the case because you, you Instagram the enemy and then you didn't text me back for like four days. So I was like, oh, he regrets this idea for sure. No, no, that's not true. That's a little different. <laughs> that was, I'm always, um, you know what I'm doing? People always ask how to get on the podcast and I'm just like, I'm just flowing. Yes. Do you know yes. what I mean? Like, I'm just like, like. It's, it's extremely authentic and it's very. I don't even know who I'm going to have on, what we're going to talk about. I just, I just thought, oh, I really like this guy. I follow you on Instagram. You're one of the few people I follow I actually look at his shit. So I was like, all right, I'll have him on. I hate small talk. You did none of that. It was, Thank it you. was the most refreshing podcast to be on. We, I literally started the Zoom and we started talking. Like, that is freaking awesome. I love it. Brass tack sort of stuff, like elaborate, tell stories. I'm a talker. I'll talk for days. But, like, forget the small talk. Let's dive I can't believe I got I to it. talk to you. I can't believe I got you to talk to you. To. You get to. Isn't that cool, man? Like, yes. I, I really, that one fires me up the most. And I've been saying that for years. And it's, uh, I practice it. I practice it all the time. I'm just, you have this perception of me and I'm happy and all this stuff, but I am just as human as every other human in the world, man. I have horrible days. I have days, I have excuses. I have weeks where I barely make it into the gym. Like I'm absolutely that way, you know, like anyone else. But I try to practice these things that I preach. And when I do, it puts me back on this path and it recognizes the abundance and, and it makes me fired up. I get passionate and I realize my purpose in my life and I realize Losing my arm was the best thing that could have happened to me. And I realized there is so much opportunity to impact people's lives in ways that I never could have before. And so I then I'm fired up. And then I'm like, what am I doing sitting here on the couch? I have, I have to get up and do something. And then my own psychology happens where so I, I get to get up and do something, but really I have to get up and do this. Like this is my this is my purpose. Are you going to have kids? Uh, I hope so. I mean, you want kids. Yeah, one day. Oh, I didn't want kids. I mean, trust right me, now. there's no hurry. And Listen. I have three, and I can't believe I have, I can't believe there was a time I never wanted kids. And then we, we got one and then I was like, I need more, I need more. But there's no rush, by the way. I'm just wondering like if you, if, if it's something you think about. And then, and then the next question was, I wonder if you'll be safer with your arm when you have kids, because like I'm already way safer in everything I do. Like, yeah. like the street in yeah. front of my house, I would ride my bike on it all the time. Now that I got kids, I, there's, not, there's, not even a, there's not even a reason for me to go out there. <laughs> that's a great point you know i love that you keep asking this question about kids and i can't wait to tell my fiance about that because the only discussion we ever have about children are your children so oh. if we have kids <laughs> we're just hoping that their hair is exactly like your kids hair and that we raise them that exact way so um if we do that'll be the way you'll be an amazing father oh well, thank you that's, yeah. I hope, I, you know, I, I bet every father hopes, every parent hopes that it'd be great at it, but I, I hope so. Just so, part, through watching these docu- this baby documentary, I'm telling you, that's what made me be like, yeah, I want to experience that. I really want to experience that. Like, that was the part where they really made it like hit home for me. There really is no rush, by the way. I had my first kid in my 40s. There's no rush. My wife had uh, the first kid when she was 39. And especially if you guys are CrossFitters and exercising, yeah, it, yeah. Everything stays working for a while. Yeah. yeah. That's great. You are on the, um, adaptive athlete, adaptive Academy athlete, adaptive athlete seminar adaptive, staff. 
Yeah, yeah Adaptive Training Academy. Yeah. Adaptive Training that. Academy staff. Yeah. What's the website for that for people to go check out? Yep. That's that whole mouthful. AdaptiveTrainingAcademy.com. That's what Okay. I'm and what Maybe are the chances if I sign up, them. what are the chances if I sign up that you would actually be an instructor at the class I go to? So here's the cool thing. The online course is built. It's done. Okay. So the online course, you just sign up and you just get started. Now Bitchin'. there are hundreds of videos where you're going to be listening to Logan. Logan is going to be talking to you, explaining a teaching point, showing a demo, an example. You're going to have Kevin Ogar in there talking about all the different wheelchair stuff and different. It's a lot of star power. A lot of yeah, star that's, power. That's a lot, man. And we've got Chris Stoutenberg, you know, the, the guy who runs the wheel watt stuff, three-time Paralympic wheelchair basketball champion. And uh, we've got Alex Erkenbach, you know, cross the seminar staff member, naval officer, wounded naval officer. So we've got, a, and we've got this incredible lady, Kristen Arnold. She's a former games athlete. She lives in Arizona and she's pursuing her PhD in universal design and education. In other words, like inclusivity and accessibility in education. Uh, she has a son with autism and down syndrome. And so she is like definitely the smartest person in the room. And she helps us embed this concept of inclusivity and accessibility and uh, kind of like universal design for anybody. You know, we can't, how hypocritical would we be if we were this adaptive training academy and the only way you can take our course <clears throat> is by listening? And what if you were deaf? And so then we just like totally knocked out the whole population. So our course is very different. I, I want people to understand. And yes, Salon, I'd love to give you free access to the course. And you can take it whenever you want. Um, and I'd love to offer your listeners a code, 10% off if you use code Savan 10. Straight up. So that's S E V A N 10. All caps. All caps. S E V A N 10. All caps. Damn. You get 10% off our course. Our course is $3.99. So it's a pretty good little savings there. Um, and yeah, like I said, our feedback has been phenomenal. Highly recommend people checking it out for even if you don't work with any adaptive athletes, it's great for understanding how to think about customizing fitness in order to maximize safety, effectiveness, and inclusion. That's the basis of what we're teaching. We do that in 70 sections. It's a robust. How course. many sections? 70 sections. We have interactions. There's clickables. There's graphics that, you know, if you've taken the CrossFit programming course, have you taken that one? It's very similar to that. So there's interactions, there's touch and feel stuff. We have drag and drop stuff. There's flashcards that reiterate teaching points. Everything you see in the video is put, the main teaching points are then put in text. So if it was a lot thrown at you at once, you're seeing it again. And then you interact with it again. And then there's a quiz after that section. So like we, it's not overwhelming um, and it's not redundant, but it is thorough. And uh, I don't mean to brag, but like I'm extremely proud of what we've developed and put online. We incorporate intellectual disabilities. We incorporate sensory, so hearing and visual impairments, how to consider them in a group setting and uh, how to consider coaching. Visual impairments, what does that mean? Like if they're ugly? <laughs> like, you know, blind. Like you can't see so good. Sam Dancer should be an adaptive athlete. He's visually impaired. You're right. You're He'd right. Be being an adaptive athlete. If he tried that, you guys wouldn't let him, right? <laughs> what if I identified? No, no, what if I identified no. with the? Anyway, I'm not gonna. Listen, go. my personal fitness goal has always been. It was the first day I joined the CrossFit gym. Uh -huh. I want a podium on a low at a local competition, our exhibition, like able body, like yeah, you know, yeah, like just you know all the local dudes in the town who are all jacked or whatever. I'm Have you done that like yet? Small, no, because like there's some really fit people here in Raleigh. Like I just can't win. But <laughs> I you gotta go, go like, somewhere. You gotta go. Yeah. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I, I like wanted to show up, kind of be unknown, and just do it all, like straight up, do it all. And even if like one workout has muscle ups, like maybe I do really bad on that one workout, but like I win every other one, and I end up like being on the podium and just love not it. making a big deal about it, but just that's the competitive side of me wanting to just be like, I fucking beat you all with one arm. Can you believe that? No yeah, scaling. Was my buddy with um, my buddy with one leg, he he told me he hates this shit. Like um, the statement, oh, you did so good for a one-legged guy. He just told me he fucking hates that. Yeah, yeah. he's always hated it. Yeah, absolutely. But people just can't help it. People, are people, man. We're all people. Yeah. That's the thing. 
We're all humans. Um, far more similar than we are different. For no matter what, oh, wow, no matter what is going on, more wisdom no matter, from Logan. I mean, dude, it's, is that not the most truthful thing you've ever heard? Right, like, right, all right. fucking way more water. Than different. Right, we're all we all got blood, we all got bones, we all got skin. We, I think right. we're way more similar than we are different. We just highlight the differences because that's what we think is important to uniqueness and and all this. But then the detriment to that is negative association with limitation and all that sort of stuff. So we're far more similar than we are different. Thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. It's an honor. This is the most fun I've had, man. Awesome podcast. Tell your Love fiance it. thanks for your time. I Tell will. your dog for keeping the barks down to a minimum. Yeah, really. I can't believe she did that. This is a great day. And um <clears throat> I'll see you around, brother. Yeah, do you want me to send you uh, a case of fiddle? Well, I can oh. do that for oh. sure. I can send you all Sorry. the fiddles you want. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. What were you going to say? What? So I definitely want you to give me your address and I'll send mm-hmm. you a lot of fiddles. Thank uh, you. But like, do you do like show notes or anything afterwards at the end of this? Like, do you want links to the, the site and the course and that sort of stuff? Or I haven't, but if you send me all that, I'll put it in YouTube. But yeah, please do that. I'll do that. Okay. Usually I'm just so, you want to know the truth. So I'll finish this show. It'll go up to the cloud, zoom cloud. And then I'm so fucking excited to post it and, yeah. and get attention for myself that I fucking <laughs> just rush it out as fast as I can. I love it. I love it. I assume that you did podcasts like that. I don't know Peace why. And, love. and like, everyone's like, there's no intro. There's no outro. There's no notes. You don't even give shit about your guests. I'm like, I don't care. I just want some comments on my Instagram. You know? like, I'm just excited. I'm just excited. I, I know I know that's the case for you because yesterday, once we realized that we weren't recording a podcast, I think two minutes later, you were in your garage doing an Instagram video talking about uh, <laughs> yes. kids and parenting and something. I was like, this motherfucker, he was just trying to get out of doing the podcast. No, that is really true. A half hour before the podcast, I come into my office and my computer's updating and it says it has fucking like... It, 32 minutes. So I text you and I said, it has 22 minutes. I just took 10, 10 minutes off to try to make you feel better and make myself feel better. Yeah, right, right. And I'm like this fuck. And it's a really cheap computer. And it was just chugging. I was like, Oh, always. That's always when it happens. Right. When you got something to do. But, All right. Yeah. Send me any links you want. This will be oh, my well. first one where I actually give it some love. There we go. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you so much. Hey, so what should I put as, what should I put as your title? So normally I don't put what their title is. Should I put, um, Logan, it'll be seven podcast nine, Logan Aldridge. And then should I put adaptive athlete, adaptive seminar staff? Should I just leave it blank? Like I do for everyone. Should I put guy with one arm? I mean, I don't like to say this, but it's technically true. I'm the fittest one arm man on earth. Oh, perfect. That's okay. I can say that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. That's it. Done. Fittest one arm man on earth. Peace. <laughs> Later, man. Peace. Bye.